you know, now we have a profile of uh, our average relative humidity that looks a lot like uh, our, our rainfall. Average relative humidity and rainfall are very similar. Uh, this part of the country, you know, mainly east of the Mississippi River, uh, has uh, relative humidities anywhere from uh, 45 percent to 75 percent relative humidity, uh, more pronounced along the coastlines. And so, you know, one of the reasons why we're talking about rainfall and relative humidity is that uh, we've got way more of a threat to buildings in the eastern United States and especially along the coast. Uh, threats about flooding, about uh, high relative humidity and rainfall, uh, damaging building materials, uh, causing buildings to be, um, you know, very wet. And, you know, the problem is here in the southeast, uh, where we got high rainfall and high relative humidity, you know, up in the 55, 60 percent relative humidity range, is that you're looking at a, a wetter building, wetter ground, wetter surroundings. And when you have to air condition, you know, taking the moisture out of the air with electric air conditioning is a very expensive process. So in general, um, we're, we have more of a challenge creating comfort and uh, having energy efficient air conditioning in the southeast than we do in the southwest because we don't have to, you know, we got 25 percent, uh, you know, less than 20 percent, 25 percent, 30 percent all through this area of the southwest where we can use evaporative cooling, we can use fans, um, and uh, we can, uh, you know, move more air through our air conditioning coils because we don't have to take any water out of the air. A strategy for cooling in the southwest <laughs> is not going to be the same strategy that you have uh, in, the, in the southeast. Because, I mean, if you tried to, to cool the air with, a, with an evaporative cooler, yeah, you could cool the air, but you'd get the air so humid that, uh, you know, sweating would be very difficult. It would be a very uncomfortable environment. So there's two completely different strategies. Uh, up here in the Northeast, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of risk for flooding, problems with snow and high relative humidity and, you know, buildings being damp. And when buildings are damp, I mean, you have to, you know, they end up being dried out by, uh, by the heating systems and you know there's some there's there's an energy effect there not as large as the energy effect uh, with uh, overcooling but have have all the way through this region uh, we really have to make sure that we understand what we're doing in terms of relative humidity and rainfall and uh, you know, flashing a building and make sure, sure that the moisture barriers are there. And then if we're retrofitting a building that we don't, uh, you know, damage the moisture barriers or that, you know, if we have problems that we're installing uh, new moisture barriers when we're renovating buildings. I mean, this is about building buildings, renovating buildings, retrofitting buildings for energy efficiency, making buildings more comfortable, more healthy, more safe. We have to understand uh, relative humidity, uh, we have to understand rainfall and, uh, and act accordingly when we're making changes to buildings or building new buildings. Let's talk about solar energy now and uh, solar the, the intensity of solar energy that actually reaches the ground. Okay, we have the effect of the Gulf of Mexico, we have the effect of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, we have the effect of uh, the Great Lakes. What do they do? Well, uh, you know, water evaporates off of them and they create a lot of cloud cover. So you can see, again, we have this, you know, the Mississippi River dividing point here and we get a little past that and uh, you know, we have less uh, solar energy here and, and more solar energy here because there are less clouds. This is more inland. 
you know, the, the clouds have to travel further from where the water evaporates, you know, to get to this area in here. So uh, it's, it's interesting how, you know, half of Texas is uh, warm and wet <laughs> over here, and then half of Texas is warm and dry. And I mean, it's just, it's just you can see it here from the amount of, of uh, solar energy. You know, here you have more clouds, less clouds here, less clouds here, less clouds here, less clouds here. You know, it looks a lot like, uh, you know, rainfall and relative humidity uh, maps of, of these regions. So, um, so the solar, you know, the potential for the use of solar energy is, is massive in here for heating. Here in the, uh, in, the, in the West, we have a lot of solar energy. You know, we, we can make a lot of electricity, we can heat our homes, but in heating our homes, we have to be careful that we don't overheat them, so that requires uh, quite a bit of design, and the design has to be appropriate for the climate. You know, design for solar home here, and for here, and for here, they're, they're different. You have to have someone who's familiar with the climate design a home. Uh, it makes sense that the map of uh, solar intensity, or what they call insulation, the amount of uh, sun's energy that reaches the ground, kind of is similar to uh, the rainfall and relative humidity maps.